Shalom, Chavarim, shalom. Let's address one of our favorite subject matters here, science. Now, as we mentioned before, what is science? What is science? Scientia. Scientia or scientia, if we go back to Latin, it means knowledge, to know. Scientia in the old Latin, modern Oxfordian, Oxfordian pronunciation, latter English pronunciation, scientia, a kind of a different way of reading, you know, the Latin letters or the so-called English letters. So we have from the ancient times, the word science is derived from scientia, scientia. In fact, um, we should actually just do a little quick, quick, quick right here. We want to speak about how scientific is the Torah and the Torah and science. Because many people say, well, the Bible. Now, when they say the Bible, they're speaking from a King James, KJV perspective. But we're talking about the Torah. We're talking about the Hebrew because you have to have linguistic, right? Linguistic science. There's Hebrew science. In other words, from the root of what science means. So what is science? We need to have scientific literacy. Right. But the first thing is, let's define the term science. Let's get to the roots. So the root is from the Latin. Right? In this Western Gentile world, the root of this is the Greco, like Greco-Roman, the, the Greek and the Latin words, especially when we get into things like science, law, right? legal, financial, literacy, the ability to read. As Robeno Yeshua HaMoshia said, he said, have you not read? One thing about the Hebrews, scripturally, biblically, according to the narrative, is that the Hebrews were very literate. Right? One's always asked about when the Bible was written, and they always point to the last, the latter times when, you know, more of the fuller scrolls were kind of compiled and put together, especially with the Septuagint, so forth and so on. But one thing is clear, even from the biblical to scriptural narrative, is that literacy, literacy is very, very important. And from the early days on social media, we had to remind ones and ones, especially fellow brothers, fellow black men, once lost, now found, that ones should read and should improve their reading. The reading, writing, what they call the three R's. It's called the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, now, arithmetic begins with the A, but they used to call it the three R's, no doubt because of how it sounds. But reading, writing, and math, basic math. We have to strengthen these areas. These are the basic areas. And many times, many ones are functionally illiterate. I mean, they can read some basic things, but don't really comprehend and understand. And then in this society, this world, you know, there's a lot of mockery, you know, of ones and ones. You remember going to school and the child that maybe has a lisp or has a little bit of a reading um, challenge or difficulty is mocked. And then they just shut down. You know, these things that happen in childhood. So as the scripture says, you must be born again. In other words, think differently. Right? That metanoia, that change of mind. So first things first, let's define the terminology we're using right here. And we'd like to give a couple of examples. Hail up to Chabad, Shalom to Chabad, you know, dot org. And also some of the other, there's some books that we came across. We need to really get these particular books. Because one thing that we have learned, just based on the studies, that the Hebrew scripture is very scientific. Right? We talk about the scriptures, when we can get into the Hebrew Right? The KJV, the translation is very important. In fact, having the King James Version and even beginning off with some of the interlinear Bible, you know, software is, is a stepping stone. Right? But it all begins, whether in English or in Hebrew, with basic literacy, the ability to read. Right? And then after having that basic ability to read, we need reading comprehension. So many ones can read well, but how well can we comprehend? You know, there's a lot of shame and pride that goes into it. And this mostly stops us from really, you know, learning and really expressing and getting to know more things. You know, we, we tend to look at the other, you know, instead of looking into ourselves and saying, what do we know? That's what science in a sense, science and truth. We're not talking about pseudoscience. I see that word ones have kind of gone to town with the whole pseudo. Right? Pseudo in the scripts is talk about pseudonymous. Pseudonymous. Let's go here firstly and foremostly here. Let's bring this up. We had a, a page on on still. Gonna touch on this particular article right here. Right? This about the Torah. But here let's just go to science right here. Science, right? Science and etymology. 
right? See right there, etymology of science, right? So here we have science, right? Let's go to science because one's all about religion. <laughs> what does that mean to you? How do you define that term? Right? Most ones are kind of trapped in this English matrix. But it's, that's not the problem being so-called trapped in the English-speaking matrix is whether we really understand how well we understand these English words. Both the words, their etymological meaning, as well as the various connotations. Right, The connotations. Science. Okay, once again, you heard that right there. Science, right? Once again. Science. That's the modern Oxfordian. That's what we mean by Oxford. Right? In Oxford, they say science. We go back to Latin, we have scientia, right? Scientia, right? right? Schiere, 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 right? To know. You see right there, Latin, schiere, right? Schiere, schiere. Then we have scientia, scientia, to know. Then it comes down to us from Old French, right? Middle English. Then we scroll down here, and you can see right here at the bottom, this is like a the simple kind of just look it up quick, you know, Google it, the word and put etymology and Google has an a interesting breakdown, a simple but basic breakdown. We're going to go a little bit deeper here because this is a very important subject matter and subject area because science has, has its, at its root, at its root means to know. What do we know? Right? See, knowing something is different than thinking something. I can think something. But I might not really know it, right? I could think about what I know. I could think about something in order to know it, right? I could believe something, trust something, you know, or admit something is true, but I might not know it's true. So, see, knowledge is very unique and to know, right? This is what science at its very root is all about. In Middle English, it says science, scientia denotes what? Knowledge. Denotes knowledge. So, what we're seeking to do is take away the spookism of science, now, yes, there is modern science, you know, and the scientific, um, you know, methodologies that are utilized to know various different things, to get to know various different areas. Because to know is a, is a whole 360, a 720, you know, a 1080, if we have the cipher and the cipher of knowing, right? So the root idea of science, scientia, from schiere or schiere, schiere is to know, right? Then we have scientia, as you see right here, scientia or scientia. Then we come to Old French, and you see right here, denoting knowledge from Old French, from Latin, scientia, right? Scientia, modern pronunciation, scientia from schiere, 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 <laughs> almost sounds scary. That's why it, science does seem scary. Now, the Greek word, right, the Greek word right here, right, the Greek word, right, episteme, episteme, right, for knowing, episteme. Now, gnosis, gnostico, right, gnosis, we also have the word gnosis, we get the word gnostic, to know, like a diagnostic or a prognostic, you know, prognosis. You know, you have a prognosis, like seeing before, a diagnosis, weighing at least two different things to try to come to a kind of a median of understanding. So here we have, what is the etymology of the word science? It originally came from the Latin word scientia. So here's at the root of it. From what word? The Latin word scientia, scientia, which means knowledge, a knowing, expertness or expertise. By the late 14th century, science meant in the English. Now see, we have to understand even the science of science. So we're addressing here the science of science. Right? What is the science of the word science? And why is science important? And we can ask the question, whose science is it really? Because some people will say, oh, that's the white man's science. Are you saying that's the white man's knowledge? That's what only the white man knows? Or did the white man discover this for everybody else? What do you mean by saying white man's knowledge? Because some of us get that knee-jerk reaction, oh, that's the white man's science. White man's science? Hmm. You, you actually are giving that to the so-called white man? That means you are ignorant of the science of science. Right? The science of even the word science. See here in this it says by the 14th century, see why literacy is important? 
not just reading, but comprehending what we're reading. By the late 14th century, science meant in English collective knowledge. But it has constantly carried the meaning of being a socially embedded activity. Socially. So we we as people getting to know, like, if I know something, I say I know something, and my brother and my friend, you know, another says, well, I don't know this, you know, or they say something different. So, you know, we go back and forth. I try to explain. I try to prove, say, what I know so that other person within the society, the community can also know. So it says right here, the consistent carrying to consistently carry the meaning of being a socially embedded activity people seeking right and here's where people might go into the whole white man's this and white man's that so that's like a lot of pseudo science right let me show you also i'm gonna show you pseudo science right there in the bible <laughs> in the new testament in the linguistic in the science of the linguistic the science of the language that's why most folks, when they talk about Bible, they haven't gotten any further than King James translation. Most haven't gotten them past. And even within the King James translation, how well do they understand the language of the translation, the science of that 1611 translation? There's a whole science to how the KJV Bible was translated and also to the proper basic interpretation, the basic science of the meaning. And when I hear people argue about something, I say, wow, some things are just a matter of understanding the word and the context with the translation and the context is shot. They're looking at it from 2022, right? Something's written in 1611 and seeing how much English has changed. Like right now, I like Shakespeare. If I'm going to get into something Shakespeare, I can't interpret Shakespeare from how we use words today because in that time they use words in a specific way. So to really get to enjoy it, to appreciate it, to you know understand what's going on, one has to get in that particular frame of mind. It's like right now, if a scientist wrote on a, a whiteboard or a blackboard a formula, who would understand that formula? Someone else who understands the science of the formula. Right? We'll see maybe uh, you know, something that looks a little mathematic. We might make out a number or the X or the N or something like that, but won't really understand what's going on. So there's a basic level right, of systemize, systemization, right? St systemizing, putting into a certain system. So people seeking, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? Right? Based on what you find, you put into a, a system, right? a diagnostic, so to speak, or an analytic, so to speak, and then you share the results. But let's just cut through all of this right here, cut through all of this right here, and get to, you know, the site, Etim Online. So let's bring up Etim Online right here. Science. What we like about this is like the old dictionary, the old Webster's Dictionary that had the etymological brackets. All right. How many of y'all know about the old Webster's Dictionary, though? You know, this is how we used to get our etymology, right, before, you know, we had all this online. But what they did with Etym Online and a few other sites is actually transfer from those old documents, right, the very same thing. We've had to kind of go check them out sometime, you know, like we see this right here and then we go check out. You know what I mean? We check out the, the hard copy, the old hard copy. So we can say this from our scientific investigation, <laughs> seeking, systemizing, and sharing the knowledge that Etym Online is pretty much right on. There's some areas that we might have a question about, but for the most part, as at least a first point of reference, first or second right point of reference, we highly recommend it to the fellow fellow disciples. So here's science, mid 14th century. So 14th century, how do we understand that? What does 14th century mean? It means it was sometime in the 1300s. Quote, state or fact of knowing, science. The state or the fact of knowing, what do you know? Not what you believe, not what you've heard, not what you think, not what you guess, but what do you know or what is known? The state or fact of knowing what is known right knowledge of something acquired by study acquired how is it acquired by osmosis i right? know by study 
See, even the scripture points to that when it says, study to show our self approved It's interesting that many of the European so-called scientists, the early on scientists, that many of them more or less was prompted or maybe even inspired by the Bible. So the Bible amongst least the known scientists, right? Those who have contributed when we look at the history of modern science, many ones were biblical people. Now, this is not to say that because they were into the Bible, that this is the reason why they were so, you know, um, instrumental towards contribution towards scientific literacy and scientific knowledge. But we definitely know that it didn't hurt. Many of them were even prompted to say that because of the Bible, right, and their approach to the Bible, because it's all about their approach to the Bible. Because at the same time, there were probably other people living at the same time who had more of a superstitious belief in the Bible, if you understand what I'm saying. Superstitious. Superstitious mean they have some faith, right? But there's a lot that they don't know and they don't seek to know. See, it's all about knowledge. And science and the Torah and the science of the Torah. This is what we originally started to, you know, cut this video, you know, to touch on. But then we recognize, since we're talking about science, we need to understand, well, what are we talking about with science? Science, etymologically speaking, the state or fact of knowing what is known, knowledge of something acquired by study, acquired by information, also assurance of knowledge, Certitude, certainly, right? From old French, science, right? Knowledge, learning, application, the corpus, like the body, right, of human knowledge. 12th century, from Latin, scientia or scientia, knowledge, a knowing expertness from science. Science or sciens, sciens, when we look at the Latin sciens, Generative scientis, right, which means intelligent, skilled, present participle of skiere, skier, skiere, or sciere, sciere, skiere, to know, right, to know. Let's bring it down right here. The original notion in the Latin verb, so the word science directly comes from Latin, right, comes from Latin, and at its base. It means to know and knowledge. But the original notion in the Latin verb is probably, right, is probably, probably is, quote, to separate one thing from another, to distinguish. Now, that's interesting because in the Hebrew, we use the word bina, bina from bain, bain, bina, which is understanding. And understanding basically in the science, the Hebrew science, right, or the science of the Hebrew language means to be able to distinguish from one thing and another. In other words, two things that are very similar, someone with understanding will be able to know and hopefully articulate why and how they're different. But they're saying that the original notion in the Latin verb probably is to separate one thing from another to distinguish or else to incise. Now, you know what incise means? Incise like an incision. An incision is cut, right? You have a lot of information, right? A lot of facts and figures and information, but you're looking to know one thing, that means you're going to have to be able to discern what bits of information or what facts or factoids you need right, to know and what parts you need to cut away. This is related to skindere, skindere, skindere. Skindere means to cut, to divide, right? To, to cut from the root ski, ski or ske, ski means to cut, to split. Now, the source also of the Greek, right, skizane, skizane or skizane, skizane. What's skizane? To split, to rend, to cleave. They, had, they say the Gothic here, the interest of the little Gothic, skydon, skydon. Old English, skiandon, skedon or skedon, skedon, to divide, to separate. Now, the OED writes this. That the oldest English sense of the word, we're talking about science here, is restricted to theology. Mm. Come again? The OED writes that the oldest English sense of the word, and we're on the science, we're on that science, right? Sense of the word now is restricted to theology and philosophy. Mm. From late 14th century, 
the 1300s, in English as book learning. So one time in the English, so the, like 1400, like 14th century, that was like about what, roughly a little over six centuries, like 600 years ago, roughly six to 700 years ago. Yeah. Book learning, also a particular branch of knowledge or of learning. So science, like the science of this, this branch of knowledge or science of that, that branch of learning. Systemized knowledge regarding a particular group of objects. So there's particular science, like knowledge. One might have the knowledge of this, right? Good not, but not, but not have knowledge of that. Someone else has a knowledge of that. So these are particular groups, right? Or particular um, areas or branches of, of learning, right? Of knowledge. Also skillfulness, cleverness, craftiness, science. Now from the circa 1400s, get this here. Now circa 1400s, so this is 2022, circa 1400 would be about 622 years ago right it says as quote experiential knowledge experiential what you experience see here's where we have the modern sense of experimentation experiment because by experimenting the results of the experiment is an experience right and then one can if one has proven something by this experiment this should be repeatable so then therefore someone else can also have that experiential knowledge if they run the experiment on it and get the same or similar results. Also, we have a skill resulting from training, like handicraft or trade, the science, the science of business, the science of making money, mm -hmm. the science of doing various things, science of cooking, the science of cooking this dish or the science of cooking that dish. For example, from late 14th century, Right. In the more specific sense, quote, of collective human knowledge. So later on in the 14th century, this became science became defined as or thought of in the sense of collective human knowledge. Right? Science is like, what do humanity, we as human beings know collectively, especially that gained by systematic observation? So somebody observed something and I said, no, that can't be. Now, if I now observe the same thing, I should be able to see what the other person observed and saw by systematic observation or by that same experiment or even by reasoning. So there's these three modes, knowledge, right, that's gained by systematic observation, right, like what we can see, what we can observe, experimentation, right, and reasoning. Right. The modern, quote, restricted sense. So now we have this modern sense of science, which, according to the definition, is called a more restricted sense of, quote, a body of regular or methodical observations or propositions concerning a particular subject or speculation or a particular speculation. This is attested within the Western Gentile world, this modern world, attested by 1725. In the 17th century, the 17th to the 18th century, this commonly was called philosophy. So what in the modern sense is like restricted to call like modern science, the definition back in the 17th to the 18th century was commonly known as philosophy. So these were philosophers. So it was philosophers that developed this body of regular or methodical observations or propositions concerning a particular subject or concerning a particular speculation. The sense of non-arts studies. This is attested from 1670. In other words, non-arts, because some people went to school for arts, different kind of arts. So the non-arts studies, the, this phraseology, right, the sense of this is from 1670s. The distinction is commonly understood as between theoretical truth, like a theory of truth. And this is where we get the Greek episteme, 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 like epistemological. You hear people say epistemology. What's your epistemology? Epistemological. What is, you know, this theore theoretical truth? And methods, so remember the distinction is commonly understood as between theoretical truth, episteme, and methods for effecting practical results, techne. 
So we have the Greek word techne. Here's where we get the sense of technique and technical. Right? We talk about technical and technology from the Greek techne. So techne, which also is a, a word that can be translated in some senses in the Koine Greek, in the Old Greek, as um, wisdom, it's really the technique. Right? Like, for example, one might know something, but to know how that something, the technique, practical, practice, perfect, practical results. But science sometimes is used for practical applications and art for applications of skill. And once again, science sometimes is used for practical applications. Science equals practical application. Art equals applications of skill, right? Like applied, we say, they say today applied science. The predominant modern use, quote, natural and physical science, the natural and physical physical sciences, generally restricted to study of the phenomena of the material universe and its laws. This wording, this idea in the modern use is by mid 19th century. This means somewhere along the mid 1800s to blind someone with science. You ever heard that expression? Right. <laughs> to blind someone with science is, quote, to confuse by the use of big words or complex explanations. Blinding somebody with science to confuse. I think this is where people have a bad kind of a taste for science is because maybe they've been blinded with science, in a sense, confused by the use of big words or complex explanations explanation. This is a test is from 1937, originally noted as a phrase from Australia and New Zealand. Right now, this here is, uh, this is the last part right here. Let's just read this on the outro right here. And we're going to pick up with the Torah, right? Science of the Torah, science and Torah. And as far as when we speak about science and quote, so-called religion, the most scientific that we have observed is science of the Torah and science and the Torah. So we'd like to address that particular subject matter, but seeing that we are leaning into this right here as a kind of a, a prelude, a prelude, so to speak. The question that we'd like to follow up on is how scientific is HaTorah, right? And also certain scientific truths that those who have studied from the science of Torah. That means getting beyond just the translations and getting into the Hebrew and the and not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law have been very instrumental in modern science, right? Modern science or modern things that we know basically are true, right? And technology that we know actually works. Like the binary, for example, male and female, one and zero. The men who founded modern science had two merits which are not necessarily found together. The men who founded modern science, which some might like to refer to as, but we don't want to even say this is European, but the European or the so-called white man, and even some of the racists, they've had some influence in it. But if you focus on what science is, you'll be able to disprove by all of their lies with science. The men who founded modern science had two merits which are not necessarily found together. What are these two merits? Immense patience in observation and great boldness in framing hypothesis or hypothesis, hypotheses, right? In other words, they had great patience, you know, to observe, observe something, not just to run off on the first observation, but to observe, because sometimes you have to be patient to observe something. It's not going to just happen when you want it to happen. And then they had great boldness in framing hypotheses, right? Or hypothesis, right? The, the ideas, you know, their theories, the ideas. The second of these merits had belonged to the earliest, right, of so-called Greek philosophers. The first existed to a considerable degree in the later um, astronomers of antiquity, astronomers, right, dealing with the stars, 
right? It's interesting in the ancient times, astrology and astronomy was viewed as one science, but the later astronomers of antiquity, but no one among the ancients, except perhaps um, Aristarchus, possessed both merits. And no one in the Middle Ages possessed either either. Now, this is from Bertrand Russell, from his book from 1945, A History of Western Philosophy. So see how under philosophy, we get this scientific connection in the so-called Western, so-called scientific tradition. Lastly, but not leastly, science. Since most people, since people must do it, once again, science, since people must do it, is a socially embedded activity. So it's all about people. In fact, you know, it's all about us, how we interact. I bring forward, I say, well, this is this. Here's my evidence. Somebody else looks at it and say, well, no, really, I, I looked at it. This is this. You left this out. And this is like kind of a back and forth, a socially embedded activity. So even here, you know, whether on the tube, YouTubes or the videos or in social media, we can be and we are about science. In fact, a lot of things that we're discovering, getting to know. Right. From our own research, putting our research out there, somebody may critique it or may add on to that research. It's socially embedded activity. Right. So in other words, this is this is a social <laughs> activity. It progresses by hunch. You know, you ever get a feeling about something, but you don't know if it's true. But then you follow it up to investigate it, to observe it, to take notes, right? run experiments. It progresses by hunch vision and intuition by what by hunch right a vision you can see something in your mind's eye right concerning the reality but you haven't really proven that what you see right is really in reality but 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 you, here's what gives you the motivation that intuition right hunch vision or intuition and intuition much of its change through time does not record a closer approach to absolute truth. Much of its change through time does not record a closer approach to absolute truth, but the alternation of cultural context. You see, culture, even the scripture, the Bible, we talk about the Hebrew science, the linguistic science. This is why there can be dozens of arguments, endless arguments about the translation. Because if you stick in the translation, you're forgetting the cultural context right, of what was translated. So the alteration of cultural context that influence it so strongly. Facts are not pure. See, you, you can't tell that to the people on social media. Facts, facts, the facts, 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 facts. <laughs> right? Facts are not pure and unsullied bits of information. So one may have facts, but it's not as though the facts is really pure or purified, and it's not like it's unsullied. That means it's, it's to say it's affected by other things, right? Culture also influences what we see and how we see it, culture, right? So when I talk about Hebrew science or the science of the Torah, a lot of people will laugh that off because they think I'm talking about what, what this thing called Bible, the translation, the KJV. We're not talking about that. Even though there's a certain science to that as well, right? It is secondary, tertiary, quadriary. It is another step down from actually going to the scripts, right? And having the science of the language, the linguistics to understand the nuances, right? That's why when we talk about science and Torah, stay tuned. Facts are not pure and unsullied bits of information. Culture also influences what we see and how. Not just what we see, but how we see it. This is why there's a whole bunch of imagined contradictions in the Bible, right? Based on translation, right? A lot of imagined, you know, contradiction because some things got lost in translation. So you have to go to the original source. Theories. Theories, interesting the word theo, theo in Greek is, is God, right? So theories, go figure. Theories, moreover, are not inexorable, right? Inexorable inductions from facts. So one has a theory, it might be based on a few facts, but it's not inexorable inductions. In other words, it wasn't inducted, it didn't come from the facts. Theories sometimes have gaps, 
The most creative theories are often imaginative visions that are imposed upon facts. You get these facts, right? And then you try to figure out, well, how all this goes together. So imagination steps in. The source of imagination is also strongly cultural. So people looking at the Bible and the English translation, even the fact that it's a KJV English translation, it's been affected by 1611 culture, English culture, the words they choose, the phraseology is very kind of Shakespearean, Elizabethan, Jamesian, different forms of English, right? Stephen J. Gould, Introduction to the Mismeasure of Man, 1981. So let's take this right here. This is the etymological chart right here. As we say, we're going to get into a little bit more right here. But let's look at some words that are related to science right here. Conscience. Conscience. All right. Um, nescience. Nascience. All right. Nascient. All right. What, do, what does this mean? Hopefully, the disciples, let's look it up. Neuroscience. Nice. <laughs> you know, no, nice. You see, nice, the word nice means not knowing. Nice means ignorance. Nice. Have a nice day. You know, nice. It means not knowing. All right. Um, omniscience or omniscience. All right. Omniscient. Omniscient. All right. Plebiscite. Prescience. Prescient. Pseudo science. Science fiction. Scienteer. Scientific. Scientism. All right. That's a, a kind of like a kind of like a religion for some. Right, scientism. So even though science is true, science is a little more accurate with knowledge. Some people just throw it all on science, so we can say that they have a kind of a faith, a belief system that it's all about science. But even science goes through those those um, filters, so to speak. Scientist, right? Scientology, right? What's this? Uh, Silet, Silicet. Skillset, Silicet, the last one. Some of these we got to look up to, but some basics right here, here, here concerning science. So here, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, we're going to pause right here, pause for the cause, and we're going to pick up with more, right? Science plus religion. Does science plus religion equal a better world? <laughs> I know some of you are shaking your head. What about the Torah and science? Exploring the interplay between faith and logic, religion, right, and critical thinking, tradition and technology, technology, Torah and science, the interplay in the world scheme. This book by Yehuda Levi right here. We also have Jewish science, divine healing in Judaism with special reference to Jewish scriptures or the Hebrew scriptures and prayer book, right? This one seems one of the most interesting got to check it out science in the light of torah right a beor ha torah reader beor in the light ha torah in the light of the torah okay that's something related right there going to pick up on this as we move forward because what the torah has said and also a lot of assumptions that have been proven true many of these have already been testified in the Torah, in the Hebrew scriptures. So we want to point to the accuracy, right? And when we look at the Hebrew perspective, and then we compare with the English, we can understand why it might not have been discovered from the English, but maybe had caused some of the English readers who were Bible-based to explore it more. But when we start to look at it within the science of the Hebrew language, it's amazing how many things, you know, that are accepted and provable science, right, are also found beor ha-Torah in the light of the Torah. So we're going to pick up on that, even look at a few of these charts you know, moving forward, science and ha Torah, right? Even concerning the flat earth, right? The flat earth or the ball earth. Which one you think Jews or Hebrews or Torah people believe? The flat earth or the ball earth? The globe earth. Actually, both views, right, are argued from the Torah, right? Which actually shows that the truth of the matter is not really either or as people actually believe, but a very unique combination of the two. Both are actually accepted. 
by those of us with Torah. The fact is that nobody has truly proved it <laughs> one or the other, although most people believe the geocentric, you know, the, what do they call it, the, um, the, the, the heliocentric model from Copernicus is true. But anyway, look a bit more on this as we move forward, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, stay tuned, stay tuned. This video right here, the science of science. Right, what is the science? Speaking about the knowledge of science, getting to the root meaning of what it means. It basically means to know. My, you shall know the truth to know knowledge. What can we truly say we know? And how well can we prove, right? Or what is the proof for what we claim say we know? Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom. This is Yadin. This is Ras Ayadonis Tafari, L-O-J, the line of Judah Society. was match you like, share, subscribe, if you will. Share, share, share. Hit that notification button. If you already hit it, hit it again. Just hit it, hit it off, and then hit it again as well. Sometimes, you know, the technology be like that. Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom. Stay tuned. More to come. Yah willing.